Cool. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Matt Ahrens. Uh, I helped to create the ZFS file system way back in the day at Sun Microsystems back in uh, the early 2000s. Uh, I work at Delphix now, and uh, I'm going to talk about some new functionality that we implemented in ZFS uh, that will be coming soon to FreeBSD. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about a lot of problems, but don't get too depressed because I will talk about a solution. Uh, and then at the end, we have uh, some exciting announcements about OpenZFS. So uh, s stay with us. Um, so first, I want to give you some background information. Uh, so I'm going, to be, I'm going to be talking a lot about ZFS administrative operations um, in this talk. So what I'm talking about is things that you do with the ZFS command, basically. So creating file systems, creating snapshots, setting properties, uh, destroying file systems or snapshots. Um, and uh, the way that this works is, you know, you run, say, ZFS snapshot. I want to create the snapshot of this file system. And uh, that's a program running in userland. It makes a call down to the kernel. That's called an ioctl. Uh, and then uh, the, the kernel processes this and eventually returns back to userland saying, yep, I created your snapshot. So uh, what does the kernel need to do? Um, we, well, we uh, decided in the early days that uh, any administrative commands should be fully written to disk before, we re before they com like complete. So we need to write to disk the changes that indicate that now this new snapshot exists. Um, so a little bit more background on how ZFS writes changes to disk. So uh, ZFS is a copy and write file system. That means that whenever we're writing stuff to disk, we're writing to a new place that was previously unused. Um, in order to do this efficiently, we batch up a whole lot of changes, typically over some, like a handful of seconds, and then um, we write out that whole batch of changes at once. So we're accumulating uh, dirty data in memory, all the changes that we need to make, <coughs> and then <coughs> excuse me, we go flush out all those changes uh, at once, which is much more efficient in terms of uh, metadata changes, et cetera. Uh, so the terminology that we use for this is um, these batches are called transaction groups, or TXGs. Uh, there's uh, currently an open transaction group. Uh, all the changes, so like if you're writing to a file or creating new files, um, all those changes are assigned to the open transaction group. And then uh, eventually we'll, we will close that transaction group. That transaction group can then uh, enter the syncing phase where it will, it will actually be written to, those changes will be written to disk. And we'll get a new open transaction group that accepts changes uh, into the next batch that will be written later. Uh, OK, any questions about that? Good. So uh, the administrative operations also piggyback on this uh, arrangement. So when we say we want to do a snapshot, userland does the actual to the kernel. That, uh, that operation is assigned to the open transaction group. In this example, it's 100. So uh, in order, then we have to wait for this transaction group to be written to disk. So um, the open transaction group is eventually becomes syncing. We write it out to disk. And then uh, once that whole transaction group has been written out to disk, then uh, we can return this thread back up to userland, and then the command completes. Um, so if you need to do multiple operations, like you want to create a snapshot and set a property on it, then we just repeat this whole process twice. Uh, and the second operation here, the ZFS set, uh, will come down as a different IOCTL, get assigned to the next transaction group, um, Obviously, it's the next or, or later one because we had to wait for the first one to complete before we issue it. So how much time are we really, are we really talking about here? How long does this typically take? Um, maybe I'll ask anybody in the audience, uh, what's the longest you've had to wait for like one of these administrative operations to complete um, where it did eventually complete? The system wasn't like totally hung or anything. Any, any experience with this? Four hours and it completed? Yeah. Wow, that's... Does that include destruction? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so, Z, so as we'll see later, ZFS destroy, if you're doing a ZFS destroy dash R, it's actually doing multiple IOCTLs. So uh, that could be kind of multiple actual administrative operations that userland has made appear like one. And, and I'll be talking more about how to accelerate that in particular example later on. What, what was your was your operation also a destroy or was it something else? Uh, 
Okay, so, so in that case, yeah. there, were, there were some other mitigating yeah. factors, but. Doing uh, a list while you're doing a lot of send receives. Doing a list generally, uh, it doesn't, doing a ZFS list doesn't generally follow this right. um, because it's not changing anything on disk. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the caveats and problems that come due to that uh, later on in this talk. Um, so typically, uh, it doesn't take hours, but we're still talking about several seconds. So you know, typically, um, when we assign to the open transaction group, then we have to wait for it to get into the syncing phase. We do um, kind of proactively try to make enter that. So often that'll happen immediately. Uh, but if there was another transaction group that was already syncing, then we have to wait for that before we can, the, the one that we care about can start syncing. So maybe we wait one second for that. Then the, the bulk of the time is spent waiting to write the user's dirty data. So this is stuff like writes to files. Um, or, or other kind of uh, POSIX level operations. So on an idle system, this might be, you know, negligible amount of time and, and then this whole operation completes in, you know, a fraction of a second. But if the system's actually heavily loaded with writes, then this might take on the order of, you know, five to 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and then finally, basically at the very end, we uh, process, we, we process the IOCTL to actually make the on-disk changes to indicate that this snapshot now exists. And that might take like uh, one one hundredth of a second. So you know, six point zero one seconds later, uh, the actual returns with the results of the operation. And you know, if we have two of them, then we're waiting approximately twice as long. If you have a hundred of them, you're waiting a hundred times uh, five seconds. Uh, so that's one. That's kind of one problem is the performance. Um, another problem with this scheme is uh, atomicity. So. In this example, we want to create a snapshot and set a property on it. Well, after we have created the snapshot, then the snapshot exists without the property being set. So uh, there's, kind of, there's really two problems with that. One is um, other applications could come in and, and you know, do a ZFS list and ZFS get and see, oh, gee, this snapshot exists. What is its you know, ZFS colon P user property? Oh, it's not there. Gee, I don't know what to do about it then. Um, the other problem is that if we were to crash at this point in time, then uh, we would have the snapshot on disk uh, kind of permanently without having this property uh, set on it. So, you know, your application or whatever is trying to do this needs to remember, oh, when we start back up, then I need to remember that I was in the middle of creating the snapshot, so I need to set the property on it or like maybe roll that operation back and destroy the snapshot. Uh, in any case, we have this atomicity problem of you can only do one of these um, administrative operations at a time. Uh, and you can, you, if, you, if there are concurrent operations, then you may end up with situations where we can't actually do what we wanted to do. So in this case, uh, we have a file system and a clone of that file system. Um, the file system can't be deleted as long as the clone exists, but there's this promote operation that swaps the um, relationship of the file system and the clone, allowing us to then delete the file system. But these are two different operations. So someone could come in in between these two and you know, create another clone or do something else that makes this delete fail, the ZFS destroy fail. Um, and you know, if you're typing this manually on the command line, it's like the chances of this happening are low and you can kind of go investigate and be like, oh, well, gee, let me do like a ZFS list and see why it failed and et cetera, et cetera. But if you're trying to make a product or an application that's built on top of ZFS, uh, having to handle all those additional corner cases is really no fun at all. So uh, there's kind of a half-baked solution to a bunch of these issues that I just mentioned. So uh, you know, in the in the early days, um, these IOCTLs were all you know basic fundamental operations. Like I would like to create this snapshot, this one snapshot. Create that snapshot, please, um, as we saw in the examples. But uh, then we ran into the problem, oh, well, that's slow. Really, I want to create a lot of snapshots at once. If I'm doing ZFS snapshot dash R, I'm creating a whole bunch of snapshots from the command line. I don't want that to have to take you know, time proportional to the number of snapshots I'm creating. So uh, we added this compound operation where you can say, oh, we can do an IOCTL to the kernel that says, create this whole list of snapshots. And um, we can say, uh, you know, they're all or nothing. Like, if any snapshot fails, then, uh, they, then, then they'll all fail. So we decide what the error semantics are for this complicated compound operation. But it turns out that um, you know, ZFS snapshot dash R actually doesn't want, doesn't totally want uh, 
all or nothing failure semantics. They want to say, well, if I try to create a snapshot, but the file system has been deleted in the meantime, then it's fine to ignore that error. But other errors really are fatal errors that I want to uh, abort the whole operation. Um, so then we can go, you know, change, change the interface of the kernel and adjust it for that. And then we come along and say, oh, well, actually, I would really like to be able to create the snapshot and set properties on that snapshot at the same time, as we saw in the previous example. So we can uh, augment this user kernel interface further and say, okay, fine, the kernel will handle that. You can pass on a list of snapshots and a list of properties with different properties that can be set on each snapshot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this solves the problem for that one particular case. Um, if you are a ZFS kernel programmer, then you can implement all of this. Uh, but what if you have a more complicated case? So uh, I'm going to give you a, couple, a little bit of background information on um, our product that we have created at Delphix that's based on uh, OpenZFS and, and tell you about like, some of the specific uh, problems that arose and why we needed to come up with this um, more uh, sophisticated solution. Uh, so just a little bit of background information about what we're trying to do at a high level. Um, the, the Delphix product uh, is a database virtualization engine. So the, the big picture is that we are ingesting data from a production database um, using, uh, like in this case, uh, typically we, Oracle is like one of the biggest um, databases that we deal with. We're ingesting it using Oracle's backup uh, protocol, which is called RMAN. We're then storing that on a ZFS file system. Um, and then uh, when we want, when the customer uh, wants to, so the big picture customer wants to do um, database, they, they want to develop their database. So they want to like add new rows, columns, et cetera, do testing on changes to their database. Uh, and so they need copies of their production database to do this on. They don't do, they don't test in production because uh, they, you know, they care about their production data. Uh, so they're creating all these copies of the production database. Our product makes it much easier for them to create those quote unquote copies because uh, under the hood we're using ZFS snapshots and clones. So once we've ingested the data from the, from the production database uh, into the Delphix engine stored on ZFS, when they need a new uh, non-production uh, virtual database, we can create a ZFS clone of that uh, production data, export that clone over NFS, and uh, then um, create an Oracle instance to, uh, to access it. Um, and this is all running, this is actually running on Illumos. Uh, and typically we're running inside of a virtualized platform like VMware. We also run on um, like cloud environments like uh, AWS and, uh, and Azure. So uh, this is a very simplified picture. Um, if you kind of zoom in on that uh, VDB creation process, there's actually a lot of uh, ZFS commands that come onto the scene. Uh, we're actually using like libzfs core uh, under the hood, but these are kind of the equivalent ZFS commands to make it easy to express. Um, so it's actually not just one file system. There's like several file systems that constitute the virtual database. And we need to create each of them. Um, in some cases, we need to create a new snapshot in order to do that. And then we need to set lots of properties like um, export them over NFS, but make them only accessible to the particular machine that should be accessing it for security reasons, et cetera. Um, and uh, the same thing occurs whenever we want to refresh a, a VDB. So uh, if we look back to like this picture, um, once we've gotten the, the non-production VDB for the customer to use, they want to be able to get new data from the production environment. So there's this high level operation called a refresh, where from the customer's point of view, the, they have their database, their database is running, we shut down their database for a moment, then then start it back up again with the latest data from production. So to them, it's kind of like magic, but uh, under the hood, um, what, all that we're doing is essentially like redoing all these ZFS steps to create another clone uh, and then exporting it uh, to kind of look the same to the client and then standing up the same Oracle instance on top of these different uh, file systems, different clones. So we have to go through all these steps again. Um, and you know, this is like 10 plus operations. So we're talking about at least 10 TXGs. Typically, this could take a, a few minutes. And then uh, you know, eventually, those old, old versions will time out and we need to destroy them. So you know, for everyone that we create, eventually, we're going to be destroying one. So we're talking about you know, several minutes to do all of this. 
So uh, this is one of the many problems uh, that we have with performance. Uh, yes? Are you communicating with the database to guarantee that when you do snapshot, you have a clean state? Um, not necessarily. Uh, so um, when we, like for example, when we, when we take the Oracle RMAN backup from the production server, the that's, not, uh, that's, not that's not consistent. Um, so it, you can think of it as just like scanning through all of the files and sending you the current content of each block. While meanwhile, like they're changing out from, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're all changing at the same time. So um, the database, you know, Oracle has a mechanism to do uh, recovery, where uh, basically when we start up that VDB, the first thing that it does is it does recovery, which uh, uses, looks at the database logs and then uses those to roll forward or back each of the transactions that might have modified any of those blocks that were changed while we were in flight. Um, so uh, at the ZFS level, we don't really have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, like at, at the product level, th those are all the things that, we're, that the product is worrying about overall. And that's, that's kind of different for other databases. Like if it's not Oracle, if it's a different database, the mechanism for doing that might be different. Um, but yeah, that's all stuff that we have to worry about. But thankfully, um, at least as a last resort, um, databases have, this, have these mechanisms built in for doing, for doing this. Um, and same with like when you take say when you take a snapshot of a virtual database, um, in that case it's it is consistent as of one point in time because it's a ZFS snapshot, um, but there still might be a lot of things going on in flight. But databases already know how to deal with like recovering if the system crashes, and when we create like a VDB from a VDB from a snapshot of a VDB, it's sort of the same thing where um, it's. It's a totally self-consistent as of one point in time view of the database and the database software knows how to do that recovery because it has to do that at any time the system crashes. Okay. Cool, okay, so now we're gonna get into what is the actual solution to these problems. Um, so we observed that you know, these core operations like create a snapshot, set a property, uh, destroy a file system, these core operations are really not changing very frequently. We, um, the set of different things you might want to combine together and the error handling semantics that you might need, those we want to change very frequently, but like these core operations don't change very often. So uh, the idea here is to stop trying to create like every possible IOCTL down to the kernel that with every possible set of semantics we might want, and instead um, send down to the kernel a little program that tells us what you want to do um, using these uh, basic fundamental operations. Um, and it can tell us you know, how to, uh, like it, it can iterate over things and say, I want to create a snapshot of every file system whose name looks like this. And, and it can tell us how to deal with the errors. So uh, let me give you an example. All right, so let's move on to an example. Uh, if we look at like uh, refreshing a virtual database and zoom into just this part of it, uh, what we're doing is creating a snapshot creating a clone of that snapshot, and then marking the snapshot as uh, defer destroy. So basically we wanna clone the current version of this file system, and uh, we don't really care about the snapshot of the, that we have to create there, so as soon as we delete the clone, we want the snapshot to just go away, so we don't have to worry about managing it. So this is an example of uh, a channel program that uh, accomplishes this. So it takes as input the, um, the name of the file system that we want to clone, the name of the clone that we want to create, uh, and then uh, it kind of, you know, just looks like a little program that would do that. Uh, this is uh, written in Lua, um, which is a very tiny um, programming language, uh, but it does have things like looping and you know, if statements and all that. Um, and we can also decide how to handle the errors. So when we do one of these uh, you know, base fundamental operations like I want to create this snapshot with this name, it gives us an error. And the, and the program can decide how we want to handle that. So uh, in this case, we're saying uh, if the error is non-zero, if there's any kind of error, then we just want to bail out of the whole uh, program in return. Uh, but if it succeeded, then we can create the clone and then mark the clone for deferred destroy. So uh, if we look back at this kind of diagram, um, this is how this might look like if you ran it from the command line. Uh, we're actually running it using uh, libzfs core interfaces. But you, know, you could run it from the command line, give it the, the script file, and then the inputs that will uh, go to the, the script 
um, the name of the, which are in this, in this case happen to be the name of the file system that we're cloning and then the name of the clone that we want to create. Um, so here it's just one iOctal down to the kernel. We have to wait for one syncing txg and then uh, we're done. So the whole program is evaluated, you know, in this tiny little part of the time there. So you might be thinking, um, whoa, like, you just sending a program down to the kernel and grabbing a bunch of locks and the kernel is going to execute it. Like, how can that possibly work in the general case? Um, so we do have to worry about things like safety. So in, for example, in this case, we're, for now, we're saying you, you just have to be root to do this. Um, there's a limit of how much memory uh, can be consumed uh, with your script. And there's a limit to essentially how long it can run. Um, and we implemented that as a, an instruction count, which is, uh, it's not like a you know Intel assembly instruction count. It's like a Lua statement count. You can kind of think of it that way. So uh, this way, your program can't just run forever or consume all the resources in the system and cause it to hang. Uh, and um, really, the design point here was for programmatic consumers. So not really people that are typing stuff on the command line saying, "Gee, you know, I need to do these seven things at once." But for for folks who are creating scripts that use ZFS or products that use ZFS that are um, calling into ZFS to do system administration. Um, and you know, not every ZFS operation fits into this model. Um, things like send and receive that run for a really long time, they don't really fit into this. Um, also like zpool level operations, uh, the things that they need to do with the pool are, pr are more complicated in terms of the internal in kernel implementations, so those aren't really a target um, for things that we want to do right now. Um, and the, the idea here is that uh, you can write a program, and the program might even have looping. It might have variable length inputs. So you might say, you know, I uh, I'm going to send into the program a list of all of the um, snapshots that I want to create, or all the properties that I want to set. Um, you can uh, there's going to be a limit to how long your program can run, but it's based on like how many Lua instructions there you're running. So you can actually test your program and uh, to the limits and see, you know, okay, I know that it can run with the uh, instruction count limit of, you know, whatever the default is, like 10 million or whatever. I know that it can run within that limit if I give it, at, you know, up to, you know, 100,000 snapshots to create. And then you know that it'll always succeed with that, even if you're running on like slower hardware or, or um, a system like a virtualized system that might have uh, scheduling issues, CPU scheduling issues, or things like that. So it allows you to kind of design for um, not for unbounded amounts of work, but for uh, an amount of work that you can define and determine what that is. Uh, okay. Any questions? Anybody want to try to? Anybody want to um, throw tomatoes at? Uh, the design of uh, sending programs down to the kernel to be executed uh, in Lua, yeah. Um, do you have an actual Lua interpreter in the kernel? Yeah. So with a garbage collector? Uh, there's, I don't think there's any garbage collection in, in Lua. Um, it's uh, every, so like every ioctal is instantiating a new Lua interpreter. Oh. So at the end of it, it all, everything that Lua allocates gets thrown away. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, amusingly so. Uh, a little digression. Lua um, does have uh, like a inter. Oh, I forget what they call it, like an intermediate language where they they like basically parse the Lua um, text of the of the program into like a bytecode. Um, originally, we were sending that we were doing the parsing in userland, sending the bytecode down to the kernel. But then we discovered that the bytecode is actually not designed to be safe. Um, so you could you could create like bytecode that was um, kind of corrupted, sent it down to the kernel, and the and then the interpreter would barf on that um, incorrect bytecode. So we switched to actually sending down the the ASCII text of the program down to the kernel, having the kernel run the um, you know Lux and Yak uh, parsing and whatnot, um, and that's actually safer. And you know the amount of code that we're talking about here is. Very, very, very small. Um, I'll, I'll have an, exa uh, an example later on of like a full length um, pr program that we're actually using in production and it still fits onto one slide. So, so what well, you mentioned the workload that Delphix is using, but you're saying it's programmatic concerns. That sounds like it's trying to drink time. Was there 
Is it the air handling? Yeah, so the, um, really all three of the problems apply here. One is performance, um, which is really, this, this is maybe not a great example because it's only like three operations. Uh, one is performance, the other is the atomicity, um, and then uh, the third is uh, maybe not really a, it, the third is a problem with the existing solutions, which is API sprawl. So, you know, we might try to solve those two first problems by creating more and more and more different ioctals to the kernel, which we've kind of done a little bit in the past. Um, so it's kind of an, an end to this API sprawl uh, road that, we're, that we've been going down. Um, and, but yeah, I'll give you some better examples that address the atomicity concern uh, in, in a minute. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll show you another um, s simple example. This one, uh, when we're doing this destroy, uh, we need to dis destroy, basically do a destroy dash R. It's destroying a file system, a couple of children file systems, a couple of snapshots associated with that. Um, the channel program to do this is pretty simple. Uh, you know, you, Lua has functions, it has recursion, et cetera. So, you know, we just take advantage of that and say, okay, I'm gonna call this, call this Lua function with whatever the argument was that was passed down, the name of the file system we want to recursively destroy. And this is going to destroy that file system and iterate over all the snapshots, destroy them, iterate all the children and call myself recursively on that. So very simple. Um, and you know, we can add error handling to this um, kind of however, we, to do sort of whatever we want to say, oh, if there's any error, in this case, um, we're saying if there's any error, then just like, get out of here, like this whole thing is completely busted. So uh, abort the whole operation. Um, and uh, in this case, we're doing this, uh, we're using an assert to do that. We could just, we could also return. Um, the assert will, uh, the assert does not, it's not like a kernel assertion where the kernel panics. Uh, it's a Lua assertion where uh, we'll abort the Lua program. It'll send, uh, and then um, uh, the, like the Lua interpreter will die and, uh, the nice thing about an assert compared to just returning is that uh, with the assert, we will gather like a stack trace from Lua and a bunch of other stuff that will help you to actually debug this. Um, and speaking of debugging, there's also the special like zfs.debug uh, that will um, log, this, log that message um, to help with debugging later on. Cool, so now let me get to a more complicated real world use case. Um, so in our product, uh, we have a bunch of snapshots and clones. They're rep representing all these um, copies of the production database and virtual databases. And we have uh, like an internal, internal database that we call MDS, which uh, is like a Postgres um, instance that keeps track of all of our internal state. Like what are all the users? What are all the other machines we need to talk to? What are all the VDBs? Um, what are all the like policies about how long we want to retain them and how much space they can use, all that stuff. So, um, and these things, so the contents that are in the MDS are supposed to match up with, um, with what's actually in ZFS, what file systems and snapshots that exist. Um, and uh, before we do an upgrade, we want to make sure that that's actually true. So that when we do the, like when we do the upgrade, we'll redo the validation. Uh, but we want to be able to, to do this validation before we do the upgrade to make sure that um, everything is in sync. Um, and uh, we also wanted to be able to uh, do the upgrade uh, um, in our labs. So basically, we want to be able to gather this information from a customer system, send it to our lab, and then do uh, you know extended validation on that so that then we can say, okay, we know that everything is, is right on your customer system. Great, now let's schedule a time to do an upgrade, schedule that downtime, et cetera. So there's no surprises once we get to um, the downtime window for the customer for the upgrade. So uh, the way that we were doing this is uh, we run ZFS list, get, all the, get a list of all the file systems, all the snapshots and, and the specific properties that we care about um, validating. Uh, and then we're gonna do a ZFS snapshot of the, uh, the, the file system that contains our internal database called MDS, so we create the snapshot. And then we like do a ZFS, you know, basically copy that, uh, get the output from ZFS list, copy it back to us and get the um, contents of the snapshot of MDS, send that back to us. But the problem is that there could be concurrent operations while this is going on. Like we might be 
creating new snapshots, destroying things. So uh, what we want is like a self-consistent point in time view of both the um, snapshot of MDS and the list of all the file system snapshots, properties, et cetera. Uh, and we don't get that because, uh, well, there's kind of two reasons. One is that even if we ignore the snapshot of MDS thing, uh, just doing like a ZFS list uh, is not self-consistent. Um, it, what it's doing is it's calling down into the kernel for every, um, for every file system and snapshot that it's listing. It's calling down and getting like, what is, what is the next snapshot? What is the next snapshot? What is the next snapshot? So if you're creating or destroying snapshots while you're in the middle of this, um, let's say you did like a ZFS snapshot dash R. It atomically creates a whole bunch of snapshots. Um, you would think that the ZFS list would contain all of those snapshots or none of them, but that's not true. You might see some of those snapshots and not, but not all of them due to the um, ordering that we iterate over things in ZFS list. And then the second problem is that um, there's like the snapshot of MDS is, is like obviously not consistent with the output of ZFS list. Like they're two different, two, two totally different commands. Like anything could happen in between them. Um, so uh, we were doing this, uh, you know, for real in production and we kept getting these like spurious failures uh, of our validation that would say, oh, you know, this file system is, the, the database says that this file system should exist. But then when I go look at the ZFS list, the file system isn't there. Like, this seems like a problem, we need to go investigate. And then we spend a lot of uh, support and, and engineering time to go figure out what the heck is going on there, only to discover like everything is fine on the customer system. It's just that the snapshot that we got was inconsistent. So, um, you know, one solution to this uh, might be to like add locking to the application to say, just don't let anything cre do concurrent ZFS snapshot, destroy, et cetera, while we're doing this list and snapshot. Um, that this, this is a legitimate solution, um, but uh, it's, it's kind of a pain uh, if your application is like a gazillion lines of Java and nobody really understands how all the parts, pieces, pieces of it work. Um, and I mean, I think it's a fair criticism of uh, you know, applications that like they should be written so that you can do these kinds of things. But on the other hand, I think it's also fair to say that ZFS should be helping people solve their problems, not creating new ones uh, for, for people who are trying to use ZFS uh, embedded in applications like this. So um, we implemented channel programs. And um, with channel programs, we can iterate over all the list of snapshots, we can get all the properties, and we can create, um, create this new snapshot all at the same time. So this is, uh, I think, a complete or almost complete, I think I, I, think I omitted some of the error handling here. But um, this is basically a complete um, channel program that does all that stuff. So the inputs to it are uh, the, name of the, the name of the file system or pool that we want to iterate over, uh, the name of the snapshot that we want to create, and then a list of properties that we want to get. So we're going to get uh, each of these properties on each of the file systems and snapshots uh, that we visit when we iterate over everything in the pool. Um, so you can see that this is like where the kind of main starts. It's like get all the properties, then um, if we wanted a, a snapshot, then create the snapshot, uh, and then return this data sets uh, object, which basically we were building up, get all will kind of build up this data sets object based on um, iterating over the snapshots, child file systems, and then uh, all, the, all the properties there. So it gets built up. Cool. Um, so currently, these are all the different things that we support. Um, this, is, this is not all the operations that ZFS can do. Um, so we, we've been adding them in um, kind of one by one. Um, next steps, uh, we have a pull request out uh, on um, OpenZFS Illumos. Uh, it's been out for quite a while now, so we need to um, get on it. We had one, one code reviewer. Uh, we would love to have more input from the community. So uh, even if you um, do not want to read through all, I think maybe it's like four or 5,000 lines of code plus another many thousands of lines of Lua interpreter. Um, we would still love input on documentation, high level design, things like that. Um, there's, there's a couple of, man, couple of new man pages that describe all of this uh, that, that it would be great to get input on. Um, and then next, 
next, other next steps are uh, adding, basically fleshing out the um, different operations you can do here. So we want to add file system creation, volume creation, clone creation, and um, also being able to set properties. Okay, questions? Any questions about channel programs? Yes. Uh, we, people often like to use a third party tool to manage their snapshots, some sort mm -hmm. of automated thing. Do you have a favorite such tool? Is that putting you in a rough spot? To <laughs> I, I don't have any favorite um, snapshot or replication management tool. Okay. Um, Does anyone else have one they want to recommend? Okay. Do you have one that you would like to recommend? I've heard of some that are very good in that they set the property, they set the snapshot properties in as ZFS properties, mm -hmm. and that allows flexibility for having various things have various lengths. And then the tool examines the properties and then acts cool. upon it. But uh, I don't know which one that was, um, but it sounds pretty cool. Yeah, and the, you know this um, ideally those kinds of scripts or or applications can use channel programs to both be faster because you know they want to create snapshots and set these properties etc um, and uh, and hopefully the error handling in those scripts will be able to be more robust and um, they will have they won't have to write as much code to get proper error handling by being able to do it down here with and atomic from a systems ministry uh, from a sysadmin point of view I want to be able to create a snapshot set properties on it sorry want to be able to create a file system mm -hmm. and then set, set properties, properties on, on it before anybody does something to it, right? These are what the snapshots are supposed to be and then yeah. the third party tool just act on it. Yeah, and um, I, one of the great things that I should have mentioned earlier is that, um, you know, there could be two solutions to this problem, right? One is I log into the application. The other is um, we could just add a new IOCTL that does this, right? Like that iterates over everything, gets all the snap, gets all the properties, creates a snapshot, et cetera. But like A, I don't think that anybody else in the entire world wants that IOCTL. That would be like a super like Delphix application specific thing. Second, secondly, um, you know, it's only like ZFS kernel programmers that can, that can do that. But um, because these channel programs are like, they're safe, they're, they are, they're executing the kernel, but we have lots of guardrails so that you can't panic the kernel with it, for example, um, you know, Application writers who don't really know uh, much about ZFS internals can read the man page and and um, and use this effectively. Same with system administrators, right? System admins could very easily like write a little script that has a um, that that runs a channel program to do their stuff instead of running a bunch of ZFS get set etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool. Other other questions um, about channel programs before I move on to. Uh, OpenZFS announcement stuff. Okay, how many people think that they might use this in their product or, oh, quite a few, awesome. Okay, so OpenZFS stuff, a uh, couple of uh, items of news. Um, so uh, OpenZFS, uh, let me, uh, background information for anybody who doesn't know, um, OpenZFS is an organization that I started that's a collaboration of um, folks who are working on ZFS, uh, typically software developers, but uh, other, other contributors as well, um, working on ZFS from all different communities. So FreeBSD, uh, Illumos, Linux, uh, Mac OS. And um, in addition to uh, being a you know, community of folks, uh, it's also, uh, we have a, a GitHub repo um, the main purpose of the GitHub repo is to make it easier for folks to upstream changes into Illumos. Um, Illumos is, you know, where kind of where ZFS's uh, first home uh, is slash was, and uh, um, you know that's where FreeBSD is pulling changes down from um, OpenZFS, and we wanted to make it easier for folks to contribute changes up, you know, say from FreeBSD um, into Illumos, so that then they're available on other platforms like Linux, etc. Um, and uh, so we, in order to do that, we created a, a GitHub um, account and we accept pull requests. Uh, you can open those pull requests. We added uh, automated testing. The automated testing uh, used to be run uh, on Delphix internal infrastructure. We've now migrated that to be running on uh, Amazon AWS, um, which means that uh, it actually costs us money. <laughs> so uh, 
Thankfully, we also, um, the OpenZFS project has joined uh, SPI, which is uh, Software in the Public Interest. Um, they are uh, a nonprofit um, based in the US that um, handles our finances and, and legal holdings. Um, so you can now make donations to help cover the cost of uh, our test runs um, using, uh, using PayPal um, and your credit card via SPI. Another exciting announcement. Okay, we have the annual, OpenZFS has an annual um, conference called the OpenZFS Developer Summit. Uh, it's going to be this year, October 24th and 25th. Um, that's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Past years it's been Monday and Tuesday, so uh, make sure your calendar is marked correctly. It's in San Francisco again. Um, the first day is going to be uh, scheduled talks. The second day is going to be hackathon. Um, all the info is up on uh, our website. Uh, registration is now open, so you can register. Um, we didn't have to turn anyone away last year, but uh, we also are not increasing the um, number of slots this year. So uh, register early if you want to guarantee a slot. Um, the other action item for all of you guys is uh, submitting talks. So we, if you have been, um, if you're using ZFS, if you're developing ZFS, um, we would love to hear about it at the conference. Um, submit your talks by the beginning of September. Uh, and other action item is uh, anybody who, who is using ZFS in their company, uh, please consider sponsoring us. Uh, we're only able to put this on because of sponsors. Um, if you've been there, I think you'll, you will recall like it's in San Francisco, the location is, is really nice, the food is great. Um, we have uh, great venues again this year. We're, uh, we're back at the um, Children's Creativity Museum for the first day and then the second day uh, we're back at uh, GitHub's um, headquarters for the hackathon, which is, was really nice. We were there two years ago. Um, so uh, contact us if you're interested in sponsoring. Um, we, were, we were lucky to get a great set of uh, sponsors in the past week since we um, started organizing this. So thanks so much to um, all of our early sponsors and I hope to see you all there. Thanks. Uh, any questions about, looks like we actually have a little bit of time left over. So uh, any questions about channel programs, ZFS in general, open ZFS, the conference? Yeah. Based on that set of current channel program, mm -hmm. what other swaths of functionality do you see coming? What's the next wave? What's the next wave? The next ones that we have seen a lot of different needs for is the you know, creation of file systems. This, you know, this is all kind of really one thing, right? File systems and volumes and clones. It's like, it's, it's really one fundamental operation. Um, and then setting properties. So um, setting properties is actually almost done. Um, we had a, an intern uh, last summer, uh, Sarah Harst, and she implemented the, um, the get prop and then um, almost finished with setting properties, but not quite. Uh, and she's actually joining us full time starting in the fall. So, you know, maybe, maybe one of her first tasks will be finishing this up. Um, uh, yeah, setting properties is obviously very key. Um, you know, that, that already came up a couple times and it's a uh, pretty, both of these are pretty glaring omissions from the current set of functionality. Um, but you know, each of these requires a lot of testing because we need to make sure that, um, you know, regardless of kind of what you're doing in your channel program, let's say you, you create a file system and then you destroy it in the same channel program. Like, that should work. We gotta go test it out and make sure that it does. Um, and other kinds of similar, like combining different operations in the same transaction group where previously that wasn't possible to do, um, we need to make sure that those are all tested out and, and work or fail in a predictable way. Um, and with properties, uh, like it was a lot, th the thing about getting and setting properties is that there's like, you can do it for 80% of the properties with like a little bit of code, but then getting all, like handling every single, like there's a lot of special cases in all the different properties. So um, Sarah put in a lot of work to, to make this work with absolutely as many properties in as many different ways as possible. Um, and if you want kind of more details about that, um, she gave a talk at the OpenZFS Developer Summit last year uh, that, that was about channel programs and kind of di dove into more, uh, a little bit more detail about um, like the, the property management part of it. 
And kind of same with setting properties. There's going to be a lot of special cases. So is there a default set of channel programs that come with set um, like not, not right now. Um, we are. Uh, we are using channel programs internally in a couple of uh, specific cases. So, uh, yeah, we would like to do that. That's not done yet, um, but we did uh, implement. Um, I think it was. I think it's snapshot. I think either snapshot creation or destroying snapshots. Okay, so we, we basically changed this existing like monolithic uh, ioctal that's like create all these snapshots and sell all these properties, et cetera. We changed that to use a channel program internally. So it's the same ioctal, but then inside the kernel, we actually use a channel program to implement that. Um, that's probably the only example of channel programs that are actually in the code base today. There's a couple of examples in the man page, um, but I think, I think this is a great, opportunity for other folks to help contribute. Um, one of the reasons that there isn't more is like we would like to replace, you know, ZFS destroy dash R or ZFS list with, uh, to make them use the channel program. But there are a lot of little, like when you look at those high level commands, there's a lot of little gotchas. Um, and uh, there, so I think that we, I think we can do it, but um, it's not like a, it's not a, this is not like a 10 line kind of just drop in replacement because the high level operations do a lot of things that can't actually be done in channel programs. Like for example, when, you know, I said we want to add file system creation. When that's going to be, but that's going to be um, pretty much equivalent to like uh, the libzfs core interface for creating file systems, meaning it just creates the file system. It doesn't mount it, it doesn't share it, um, it doesn't do any of the stuff that is currently really handled by user land. So um, to replace the ZFS create command, we have to both like do the, do the IOCTL to do the channel program and continue to do all this other stuff. So, uh, and, and there's a lot of other exceptions like that for these other um, examples. So um, it might make sense to create a new set of scripts or something where um, it's like the, the, the semantics aren't exactly the same as ZFS destroy or some, or some existing thing, but it does uh, a really useful operation that like if you, if you meet these criteria, then you, know, go, you can go use this channel program, which will get the job done in much less time. Or the example I wanted is something you can't currently do, which is a recursive rollback. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So if we create that as a channel program, so we can have maybe a set of these that yeah, totally. Like a default search path for channel programs. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Are there any known or planned uh, D-trace integration opportunities, such as I'd love to snapshot at n bytes written to a data set rather than on a time schedule? <laughs> um, well, I don't know that that's necessarily, I don't, I don't know that I would use, for that, so let me answer two different questions. One is um, dtrace integrations. Uh, you can use dtrace to observe all this stuff. Um, you can also use dtrace to, you know, to, like you can use the system action in dtrace to trigger arbitrary, you know, user programs to be run. Um, the second part of your question is uh, I want to create a, uh, I want to create a snapshot after so many bytes have been written. Um, I don't think that you need to use dtrace or channel programs for that. I mean, you, the same way that um, existing snapshot utilities have like a timeout where the, it's just some user land program, it runs every so often, it checks, oh, has the, has the requested time elapsed? If so, create a snapshot. Um, you could do something very similar for, but just add a, you know, amount of space written, right? Like that's a property to ZFS. So you can just ask ZFS like, okay, you know, the file system has a property set on it that says, I would like you to take a snapshot every gigabyte that's written. And then let me ask, get, get the other property that says how much space has been written since the previous snapshot. Okay, was that more than a gigabyte? Take a snapshot. So um, I think there is opportunity for 
all of those things, but maybe uh, to solve different problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then the read of the written property on every data set to see is it time yet yeah you could take like a minute to walk all your data sets to find out if you should take a snapshot yeah so um we did uh so if you kind of take what i've said and extrapolate it then um the get the get prop might be faster or slower than doing it the old way the issue is that um uh you know, as I said, like the channel program comes down and it gets assigned to a transaction group. Then we got to wait for this to sync out. So like that, that could be, you know, five seconds versus just getting the property. Uh, normally it doesn't have to go to syncing context at all. We just get, get that one prop in return. Uh, but I did, I did not include in here open context channel programs, which is uh, like a special mode of running the channel program where you can't make changes, but it also doesn't have to wait for this. So we, um, Sarah implemented that in order to have the getting, so like you can write a program that just does iteration and getting properties that runs in open context that doesn't have to wait for a sync. So um, you can do that and then it's gonna be more or less the same performance as the traditional like property getting IOCTLs. Um, that said, even though you're not doing a TXG sync, we're still like, we're still holding all the right locks so that you see a consistent point in time. Um, which is great because you get like a consistent view of all the different properties and, and snapshots that exist. But it does mean that um, if that takes a really, if your script takes a really long time, then you're blocking other things from happening, um, other administrative op operations, you know, creating snapshots and stuff like that. Net, it should be faster than taking the log, getting one property, dropping the log. Yeah, like net, net should be faster, um, but you still want to probably be aware of like if, if it takes you know, 10 seconds, that might cause uh, other performance implications. And, and we're aware of that problem and we're, we're working on that as well um, because the main issue is that like doing the iteration and getting the properties, like the CPU runtime is almost always like trivial. Um, but if some of that data is not cached in memory, then you're gonna have to go read it from disk, which could take a really long time and you're sitting there with these locks held. So we have at least a few kind of quick fixes for um, helping to ensure that that, that kind of metadata, metadata will stay cached um, all the time so that you won't, you'll be less likely to um, run into those performance issues. Any more questions? No? Okay, well thanks for your time and uh, I'll be here for a couple more minutes if folks wanna come up as well.